Hi everyone, welcome to today's lecture for preliminary biology. Um, I am Mahima and today I will be presenting the lecture today. Um, and sorry for um, starting it a bit late. Um, we had a bit of issues with technology as usual. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited. Let's get straight into it. I feel like today is mainly gonna be just introducing the main concepts um, and I guess like the foundations that you would need for um, year 12 biology. And um, so we'll look at, you know, um, structures and functions of cells as well as um, common biochemical processes. And just a quick bit about ATAR North. ATAR North has been running free lectures since pretty much 2008. And our main goal is really just to help students um, within either the preliminary or the HSC journey and just enable them to have a better learning experience. And some of the free resources that we offer are the lectures, which you guys are watching now, um, as well as things such as forums and discussions, um, which also include things such as like study notes. We also have ATAR calculators as well as the newsletter. However, if you guys are looking for more of a tailored approach, we do offer our TutorMart program. So that's pretty much just like online tutoring for a bunch of different subjects um, from, you know, people who've already done this before, like myself, um, and who've gained so much experience as well as um, good techniques. We also have Ed Unlimited, which is pretty much like Netflix for... Um, your studies because there's literally almost every single subject that you could possibly think of um, and there's notes and exams and um, topic tests as well. We also have printed study guides so if you prefer a more of like a hard copy version you really like to use um, you know physical notebooks and things like that um, we also offer that as well. So there is something for each and everyone that we offer at Tutesmart. And just a bit about me, I am currently a chemistry tutor at TruthSmart. I um, teach year 12 chemistry. I graduated in um, 2021. And like you guys, I also completed biology, chemistry, extension two maths. So obviously includes extension one maths, as well as French continuous. And currently I'm studying a bachelor of science and law at UTS. Before I do decide to dive a bit into, um, I guess, like the content side, I do want to explore a bit about the syllabus. The syllabus is really important because that really just sets the um, foundations that you're going to be needing for year 12 as well as year 11. Um, and really, like, this is, this is where your teachers are going to be testing you off of anyways. So it's good to just understand it and just break it down and know what each dot point is asking you. So it's a skill also as to how to read the syllabus. Overall in um, 11 and 12, um, there is not only, you know, like your modules, your content modules, but also something called working scientifically. So this is really testing your application skills. Um, alongside your theory skills. And this is what you're really going to be seeing in um, depth studies as well as PRAC exams. And even sometimes actually in the HSC exams as well in certain questions. So this includes things such as um, creating a hypothesis or um, creating an aim. So that includes questioning and predicting. Planning investigations and conducting investigations are also more the practical side of it. So that includes things such as doing risk assessments, creating methods, um, and also like looking at which materials are easily accessible um, that will help you to achieve your aim for that particular experiment. We also include things such as processing data and information, analyzing it. Um, so that will pretty much include things such as your method as well as your results and discussion. So mainly the, mainly the discussion section um, and the results section, because you know in your results section, you would be tabulating things, you would be doing graphs, as well as um, other kinds of data um, representation and analysis. 
Um, and alongside that, you'd also be looking into, in your discussion, um, areas of validity, reliability, and accuracy, um, which I'll talk a bit more about later on. Um, and you would also look at ways to also improve your um, experimental method so that it's um, more accurate or valid or reliable um, when you do it the second time around. Throughout your um, year 11 and 12 um, syllabus, you'll also be doing a bunch of problem solving because that's pretty much all questions are, um, and also learn how to write succinct answers and communicate um, you know, using scientific language, but also in a concise manner. So that's pretty much what the working scientifically um, module kind of looks like. Now I'll just do a quick run through as to what each of um, like the different modules include. Starting off with 11, we have modules one to four. Module one pretty much, which is, module one is also the main module that we're gonna be focusing on today. Module one pretty much just introduces you to basic cell concepts, um, as well as things like cell structure, cell function, biochemical processes. And module two does branch off more of that. And um, it looks more into, I think, like the organization of um, various species and how we, um, a bit of also like scientific naming as well. Module three, as the name suggests, goes a bit more into biological diversity. And this is where you kind of look at various theories of evolution, um, such as Darwin's theory of evolution from my memory. And module four still continues off of that as well. So you look a bit at um, certain structures of ecosystems and how they function together and certain relationships that exist within an ecosystem. Um, which I won't really be touching on today, but it's pretty interesting to learn. I feel like module one and two is more of like, I guess like you could say animal-based anatomy, um, but module three and module four really just looks at everything in a more broader perspective and, um, you know, just looks at, you know, the ecosystem and species as a whole rather than focusing on like the inner structures. Then you have module five to eight. Module five to eight does use knowledge that you learn in um, modules one to four. So a lot of um, stuff from module one to two overlap in your year 12 syllabus. So it's good to make sure that you understand module one to two. My school actually did this the other way around when I started year 11. So they started off with module four and then they went backwards. So that by the time we went to module one and we started off with, um, I think we started off with module five, um, it clearly linked to one another. So if your school's not doing that, just make sure to revise these two modules before hopping on to um, year 12. Um, so just moving on as to what these modules really are talking about. Um, if you look at module five and six, this is really just looking more into DNA, um, the structure of DNA and further biochemical processes such as producing proteins and um, things like that. And then module six looks more at technology. So one common focus within the um, total syllabus of year 11 and 12 is that you're always going to be focusing on some kind of technology. So it's good to have case studies for specific syllabus dot points and i'll get into that later you also have um module seven and eight so these modules are pretty fun because they're really just talking about diseases um so module seven pretty much talks about um infectious diseases um you look at a, a bunch of different um diseases how they spread the symptoms that they present um and it's really interesting and then module eight looks a bit at non-infectious diseases so these diseases are non-communicable you can't transfer them to one another um from one person to another and um you also look a bit at epidemiology so you look at population dynamics and kind of understand how um you know certain trends are more prevalent in different um countries and why they also occur so it's really interesting to understand not only what these diseases are but also why they happen what other factors within our society play a role in um the trends of these kinds of diseases 
so yeah that's pretty much an overall i guess um view of the year 11 and year 12 syllabus and throughout your working scientifically skills so alongside this you'll also have your four modules like i mentioned and each module is around 60 hours that's the amount of time you'll be spending that in school and then you also have something called depth studies so depth studies are pretty much just like um a research task that your school gives you and um around 15 hours will need to be taken to do the research task at least in school but sometimes what schools may do is that they may um take some time outside of um you know your study time in school itself and they may ask you to um do the depth study at home as well and if you guys do want um question banks as well as biology notes here are the qr codes so you can um access it and i believe that this recording will be accessible, I think, for around a year. And um, you'll also be given access to um, the slides as well that I'm presenting today. All right. So now that we've focused a bit on um, how the syllabus works, it's important to also understand how to read the syllabus. So like I mentioned, there is typically like how the syllabus is structured is that you have your modules. In your modules, there'll be inquiry questions. And under those inquiry questions, typically there's around two to three from my memory, um, you have like a set of dot points that are pretty much like your syllabus outlines. So it's important to not only take care of the syllabus um, dot points, but also look at what the inquiry question is asking you. Um, and the reason why you have to take note of the inquiry questions is because the inquiry question is set out so that by learning all the syllabus dot points, you'll be able to answer the inquiry question. You can also take the inquiry question as a way um, to test your knowledge on something. So, for example, um, if you look at reproductive processes um, and you learn that thoroughly, you should be able to answer how reproduction ensures the continuity of a species. Um, and that's how you kind of can test your knowledge. If you can see a gap um, and you can't explain certain things, then you realize, you'll realize that um, you know, you're missing something and that um, you need to go back and further on um, revise your knowledge. Um, so that's how I would kind of take note of the inquiry questions. I'd also look a bit at um, the working scientifically skills as well. So it's really important to look at um, the verb that is being analyzed over here. In this case, um, if we look at this example, it's asking assess risks, consider ethical issues and select appropriate materials and technologies when designing and planning an investigation. So there's a bunch of verbs involved in this. The main ones are assess, consider, design plan right and select i guess so assess is the main one over here and um when you go to the nessa website it will show you um a bunch of what the hsc verbs are and the definitions for them as well it's really important to understand what those verbs are they're called directive verbs um and also look at what it's trying to ask you so like look at both the content side of it so this is really just looking at designing and planning and investigation. So it's looking at things like methods, what materials are you choosing? Have you done a risk assessment and have you assessed that risk assessment? Like as in, have you analyzed the risks and have you made a judgment on it? So these are the things that you'd have to consider in a working scientifically skill dot point because they're not only tested in your practical exams, but ultimately they're also tested in your trials as well as your HSC. And that brings me to my next stop point, um, paying attention to wording. So like I've said, directive verbs are really important. And you can see here that each, um, I guess, stop point within the slide has a different directive verb. And you can see here that there is investigate, there is evaluate, and there is also model. So these verbs also um, have, I guess, like, 
a lot of meaning to them um, when you're doing your um, responses. All right, so that's pretty much a syllabus. Um, let's move on to module one. And module one is pretty much cells as the um, basis of life. So module one first starts off with um, looking a bit at cell structure. So cell structure pretty much comes under the inquiry question of what distinguishes one cell from the other? Now, cell structure um, has evolved a lot, so you um, have different theories around it, um, but ultimately it's come down to cell theory. Um, cell theory pretty much just says that everything's made up, not everything, sorry, all living things are made up of cells. Cells are pretty much like the unit blocks um, and the main basic structural form for organisms. And then all cells come from pre-existing cells. So that relates to um, things such as mitosis as well as meiosis. Within cell structure, you also look at different categories of cell structure. So um, in this case, we look at eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. So this pretty much just relates to the organelles present within um, the cell. So just like how the human body has organs, cells have organelles with when uh, I can't speak today um, within them. So these little mini blocks actually help um, with the functioning of the cell, and they do play a large role. Um, and I'll explore the different functions of each of these um, organelles over here later on. In essence, what um, eukaryotic cells are, are cells that have a nuclear membrane and membrane-bound organelles. That means within an organelle, you have a membrane enclosing it. And you can see that in the nucleus over here. You have a nucleus because the nucleus is actually surrounded by a membrane. Um, and examples of eukaryotic um, organisms are both plants and animals, so we're eukaryotic um, organisms. Um, and alongside that, you have pretty much the opposite. So that's prokaryotic. Prokaryotic cells do not have any membrane-bound organelles. And you can see over here that you actually don't even have a nucleus. Um, and that's because nucleus is a membrane-bound organelle. Instead, in prokary uh, prokaryotic organisms like bacteria, you um, tend to just have your um, DNA pretty much floating around in something called a nucleoid. So it's like similar to a nucleus, but not exactly um, a nucleus. Um, and one thing to note is that due to like the lack of a um, membrane bound organelle, um, prokaryotic cells tend to be more simpler than eukaryotic and um, they were actually the first cells on Earth. So I guess like how you can consider um, cell evolution is as going from simple to more complex. And that's really how it started. You started off with organisms like bacteria, and then you slowly evolved into multicellular organisms. So yeah, it's pretty cool, um, I guess, like evolution of organisms on Earth. Further going on into the characteristics of eukaryotic cells, I have mentioned that they are membrane bound. Um, in both the, the nucleus as well as its other organelles. Um, one thing to also note is that eukaryotic cells doesn't have to be only multicellular, like plants and animals. It can also be unicellular, um, whereas prokaryotic are mostly unicellular. So that's just one thing to note. And each of their organelles pretty much perform their own um, biological function. And in this case, um, when you compare how DNA is stored within the, um, with the eukaryotic organisms as well as prokaryotic organisms, um, it's pretty much stored within the nucleus, whereas it's stored in the nucleoid over here. So it's important to understand the differences as well as the similarities um, because you'll be um, pretty much asked like a compare question as to how um, you know, these structures work. 
And I've also mentioned that, you know, animals and plants are examples, but fungi is also another example. Prokaryotic cells, like I've mentioned, does not have any membrane-bound organelles. One thing to note is that some prokaryotic organisms, like bacteria, um, have something called plasmid. So not only do they have, you know, normal DNA um, that we have, but they also have rings of DNA called plasmids. Um, and some of this genetic material is used as an adaptation to survive. Um, and sometimes these um, bacteria actually grow in a colony and they work together pretty much. They share their resources. Um, and yeah, an example of it is probably like um, biofilm or plaque. So plaque in your teeth forms because you have a film of bacteria that are pretty much working together. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much how um, this works. And some of these adaptations come from plasmids. A few key terms are also written over here. So I have also mentioned what an organelle is. It's pretty much just like structures that help with certain functions within a cell. Um, and membranes is like a thin sheet of tissue. So it's like lining, I guess you could say, um, within an organism. And this table pretty much just summarizes the similarities and differences between eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. You can see here that prokaryotic cells both have DNA, they both have a cell membrane. There's also one thing I forgot to mention, um, even though there's no membrane bound organelles, all of them have a cell membrane. Um, so I guess like that's just that one exception you have to be aware of. Um, and both of them have cytoplasm. So that's pretty much like a liquid that these um, organelles float in, you could say. The difference is, is that prokaryotic tend to be more simple um, and prokaryotic cells have a nucleoid, um, not a nucleus. Um, and obviously the difference not being, um, not having those membrane bound organelles. Moving on to what exactly organelles are, like I said, they do have um, specific functions. And I've mentioned that nucleus stores genetic information. However, there are a bunch of other organelles and let's go through each one of them. Um, within your um, cells, so pretty much like your um, eukaryotic as well as your prokaryotic cells, the common ones that you have um, are things such as a cell membrane, like I mentioned. The cell membrane is really important because it's selective in the sense that it controls what goes in and out of the cell. You don't want some things to be in excess or to be um, limited either because that can actually hinder certain cell functions. Um, and so that's really important. Um, you will sometimes will also have a cell wall. Um, most prokaryotic organisms do have a cell wall and plants, which are eukaryotic, also have a cell wall. Um, you also have something called vacuoles. Vacuoles are pretty much just vesicles that contain fluid. So if I go back, I can try showing a picture of a vacuole if I find one. Um, I don't think this one has it. Yeah, I don't think we do have pictures of vacuole. But yeah, these pretty much just contain fluid and help with structural support. Some of the other main organisms, not organisms, sorry, organelles you would have um, heard of are things such as the mitochondria. It's known as a powerhouse, the cell, but really what that means is that it produces ATP. ATP is, um, well, the full name is adenosine triphosphate. Um, but all it does is just help produce energy um, for the cell so that, you know, you can continue all these wonderful um, biological processes. You also have things such as the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, these are the sites of protein and lipid synthesis. These are only present within eukaryotes, not prokaryotes. So if I go back, hopefully I can show a picture of the endoplasmic reticulum and you can see over here that you have the endoplasmic reticulum over here there's something called a smooth endoplasmic reticulum and a rough endoplasmic reticulum um 
the smooth endoplasmic reticulum doesn't contain ribosomes, whereas the rough endoplasmic reticulum has ribosomes. And ribosomes are very important because these are actually the site of protein synthesis, um, which is something that you will learn, I think, in year 12. So don't worry about that right now. Um, but yeah. Ribosomes are pretty important because literally everything around us is literally made up of protein. Um, so it's a pretty important function. Um, you also have other structural support organelles such as the cytoskeleton. Cytoskeleton um, is a bit weird because it sometimes shows up in prokaryotes um, and shows up in eukaryotes as well. Um, they're just pretty much like string-like structures um, that help with just like stabilizing the cell. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a picture of um, cytoskeletons over here, but yeah, they're just like tubules. They're just like long structures. Um, we also have the garbage disposal of our um, cell, which is the lysosomes. These pretty much just have enzymes that just break down waste. Um, and then um, they just help with removing any byproducts that you don't actually need within the system. You also have um, the Golgi apparatus um, over here. This is the Golgi apparatus. It's very weirdly shaped because it helps to increase surface area. And when you have more surface area, you can actually package more proteins. Um, so that also plays a larger role. Um, you also have chloroplast in plants um, and they contain chlorophyll, which helps photosynthesis. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much the main, I guess, organelle that you have, and each of them have different functions. So you can see here that the overall functions include things such as protein synthesis, lipid synthesis, packaging of proteins, um, and things such as like photosynthesis, as well as structural support. So yeah. Um... And adding on to, I mean, this pretty much just summarizes what I've said, um, but I think I missed two more organelles. Um, we have centrioles and we have cilia and flagella. Centrioles are mainly in cell division, so um, they only pop up in cell division, which I'll talk a bit about later. Um, and cilia and flagella are just like tail-like structures on um, prokaryotes mainly, um, and they just help um, navigate. Um, sperm cells also have that tail-like structure because they need to navigate as well. So that's also just used for movement for these kinds of cells. Moving on to actual technologies that you have within your, um, I guess like syllabus is mainly microscope. I'm just going to check how many questions I have written on for um today's lesson. All right, I think we have plenty of questions, which is lovely. All right, let's continue on. Um so yeah, like I mentioned, um in 1.1.2, this is pretty much just telling the different technologies that you have um, to determine a cell's um, structure as well as function. Um, so I guess like the technology that we'll be mainly focusing on is microscopes. So microscopes are pretty important because, you know, obviously you can't see um, organelles within the naked eye. So you need the help of a microscope in order to do that for you. So microscopes have different um, kinds. You have something called a light microscope. Um, light microscopes pretty much enable light to pass through a condenser and then through a specimen. I'm just trying to check. Okay, I do have a diagram. No worries. Um, these pretty much just allow light to pass through and if you have different lenses on each of the um, uh, microscope and that helps with magnification so as you change your lens you actually increase the magnification so you go closer to the cell and you're able to see certain organelles that show up. 
Um, however, not all organelles show up in a light microscope. So that's one thing to be aware of. You can see here that this is actually the picture of um, an onion cell um, because it's stratified like this. Um, and really, you don't actually see um, like other organelles such as, I don't know, the mitochondria, for example. Um, and that's because not everything shows up in a light microscope. So in this case, only um, the nucleus shows up and you can also see things like the cell wall and then underneath that, the cell membrane. It's very tiny over here. Um, and then you also have small structures called vacuoles. I'll just try zooming in so that you guys can see it much more clearly. So yeah, if you see it over here, there's tiny structures and those are called vacuoles. And um, like I said, they're just like vesicles that help with structure. Um, and the key terms that you'll be needing to know today are pretty much magnification as well as resolution. So like I said, magnification is just helping to go um, increase the size of the image because you're going close up. And then resolution is like pretty much the ability to distinguish organelles, so like the clarity of within a microscope. And you can see here that this is a diagram of a light microscope. So you have a lot of different, I guess, like parts that you need to name. You need to be familiar with each of these um, because it's kind of hard to not use them to use the microscope without knowing not knowing all of these. Um, so we have things like the arms. This is the area where you hold the microscope because that's how you, that's where you're meant to technically hold it. Otherwise, you damage other pieces. Um, you have your ocular lens, which is pretty much your eyepiece over here, um, and then the tube that pretty much links to your um, lens over here. So if we look at each of the parts, you have the objectives over here. So you typically have a times 10 objective, times 40, and then times 100. Um, then you typically insert your slide over here. So you prepare a slide um, and that pretty much just helps to, um, I guess, like have a better view of um, your species. So if I go to Google, I might be able to show you a um, picture of a um, slide. Um, so microscope slide. Okay, that just shows you the normal slide. Maybe if it's a prepared slide, um, we can show you one is not what I'm looking for. Uh, so yeah, this is what a prepared slide looks like. So um, you will also learn how to prepare slides. Um, probably won't be dealing with um, something like blood, probably just like a normal like plant cell or something like that. But yeah, um, this is what a slide looks like. So it's pretty cool. So yeah. Um, if we go back to um, our diagram of um, microscopes, so that's your slide and just use your stage clips to ensure that your slide is being held in place. Then you have the stage. Um, the stage can be adjusted through the different knobs that you have. So you have your um, coarse adjustment knob and then your fine adjustment knob. So um, your coarse adjustment knob, I think, uh, both of them help with adjustment. I forgot what the course adjustment knob is for, but I know that the fine adjustment knob helps with, um, just the clarity of your, um, uh, slide that you see under the eyepiece. And then you have your light source. This is where the light is shone through. Um, and you also have a knob on, I think the other side. Um, the knob just helps to move the stage up and down. So it depends on how close you want um, your um, slide to be because sometimes you may think that you're going too close to the slide and that will help, but sometimes it just makes things worse. You can't really see anything. So that's just a good thing to be aware of. 
So yeah, using a microscope is really fun, but it's also just a lot of trial and error, just understanding the different parts that um, are with it. You also have um, something called an electron microscope. Unfortunately, in schools, you only use this kind. Um, I've never really, actually no, I've never used an electron microscope before. Um, but these are really cool because they actually help um, give you a more detailed image and enable you to see more organelles. So you may get a question, um, let's say in um, your exams, to um, compare between a light microscope and an electron microscope. So in instances like that, you would provide your similarities and your differences. Similarities is that you can see organelles, both of them enable to see certain organelles. However, in an electron microscope, the ability to see more organelles is better. Um, you know, you can see, um, I think, further structures as well compared to something like a light microscope where you can only see things like the nucleus and a cell wall. So yeah, it's pretty cool and interesting. Um, and the way that these microscopes, or rather the electron microscope works, is that it pretty much just streams a bunch of electrons um, and these electrons pretty much just bounce off. Um, and this just um, has a shorter wavelength than visible light. Um, and this just enables a more detailed image. Moving on to that, there's also two different types of electron microscopes. There is your transmission electron microscope, um, as well as your scanning electron microscope. Um, and the way that these work are a bit different. Um, so you can see here that in a transmission electron microscope, what happens is that the electron just passed right through the specimen. Um, and this enables you to see things much more close up and you can see that over this image here it's very detailed um you have a higher magnification as well as having a higher um, resolution and um you can see things up to 10 million times more as well so it's um really cool and then you also have something called a scanning electron microscope so this is pretty much the one that i was talking about earlier in a scanning electron microscope, um, the electrons pretty much just bounce off the surface and it creates a 3D image. So that's why you can, in this case, see red blood cells like this that are shaped like a donut. Um, so yeah, this is pretty much how they work. It's really cool and interesting. Um, so yeah, you can see the difference of that in a TEM microscope. It's not a 3D image, it's a 2D image, um, but it's very close up and detailed. Whereas in a scanning electron microscope, it would be much better to um, see the overall structure of a cell. So yeah. Um, another question that they may also ask you in the exam is something like um, whether, like they'll give you a structure and they may ask you um, which electron microscope would be better for it. If they just give you something like seeing the structure of a cell, then you would probably say that, you know, you would use a scanning electron microscope because it helps to create a 3D image so you can actually see the structure of a cell. So these are questions that they may ask um, and you just got to be prepared for um, instances like these. So yeah, that pretty much just explains um, light as well as electron microscopes. Um, in terms of just other kind of factors that you would um, include, um, light microscopes tend to be uh, cheaper and they also be quicker because um, I guess like electron microscopes are much more complex um, within your, um, I guess like studies. So they don't typically use it unless um, you really need it within like a scientific lab. Um, and it's also much more um, time consuming as well. So I guess that's the um, disadvantage of um, using um, an electron microscope. So another thing to also note is that in light microscopes, you can use living cells, whereas in electron microscopes, it's non-living. 
So unfortunately, um, you do have to use specimens um, that are no longer alive, which is really sad. So I guess that's also kind of like, I guess you could say an ethical reason um, as to which microscope you would be preferring. Um, and yeah, this pretty much just summarizes what I've been um, saying within you know, this lecture. Both electron and light microscopes enable you to see different organelles. Um, but I guess like, oh, how do I explain this? I guess like the, um, I guess, oh my God, I'm losing my words. Um, the breadth of like which organelles you can see is smaller in a light microscope, right? Um, because in light, it's only things like nucleus or cell membrane, same thing in electron. Um, but electron can, um, show you much more smaller um, organelles as well. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, and also the wavelength also differs because light has a wavelength that is longer in comparison to some things like electrons. Um, so that's also just, I guess, the more physics thing um, to be aware of. So yeah, let's move on. And these are pretty much just slides that you can see um, from the 11. Um, and you can see here that this is pretty much what leaves look like. And I think this is um, an onion cell from my memory. And this is how a slide also looks like in um, under like a light microscope. So yeah, it's pretty interesting. Um, I didn't personally take these um, slides. My slides are I don't think I have like pictures of slides anymore. Um, but yeah, these are just pictures from another lecture as well. All right, moving on to um, the fluid mosaic model. Um, the fluid mosaic model is pretty much the structure that we look at for the cell membrane. So you may just think that the cell membrane is just a tiny little membrane over the cell, but actually it's actually a much more complex thing and it's really important as well. Um, this is pretty much the barrier for a lot of um, things that enter the cell and you know get removed from the cell. So it um, helps and regulates cell function as well. It's really important. Um, and you can see here that there's not only just the membrane over here, but there's also small proteins that are embedded within the um, cell membrane. The cell membrane has, um, I guess, like a name called the fluid mosaic model. The reason why it's called fluid mosaic model is because um, they propose that this model um, of the cell membrane shows that the cell membrane can move and um, change shape without um, altering its function. So really, this is what it looks like at the end of the day. Um, so if we look a bit more as to what is um, in the fluid mosaic model, there's not only just the phospholipids, phospho meaning phosphate. So these are the phosphate heads, lipids meaning fat. Um, so these are phosphate and lipid um, tails, and these are embedded. And then you also see proteins that are within the cell membrane. So you have things such as um, peripheral proteins, channel proteins, carrier proteins. I'll look at all of these functions later on. Um, and you also have uh, things like cholesterol. Cholesterol um, is really important within the cell membrane because it helps with the stability and the fluidity as well of the cell membrane. One thing to also note is that the phosphate head is polar, whereas um, the fatty acid tails um, within your cell membrane phospholipids um, is nonpolar. So that's why these um, tails face each other pretty much um, because they pretty much have attractions to one another. Um, in chemistry, we call them dispersion forces, but yeah, um, there's also a way as to how 
biology can link with chemistry as well. So yeah, these are pretty much um, the main elements of the fluid mosaic model. All right, now that we have um, explored a bit about the structure, now we're just gonna move on to questions. The first question is asking you, what are two main types of prokaryotes? Um, pause this video and have a go at the question. Hopefully you had a go at the question um, and the correct answer for this is B. So B pretty much um, is the correct answer because those are the main two types of prokaryotes also because you don't actually include viruses. Viruses are actually considered as non-living. Um, so they're not really, I guess, like characterized within um, either the prokaryote or eukaryote category. Another thing to also note is that eukarya is also not included. Um, eukarya should signal you that this is pretty much the opposite of a prokaryote, so it's a eukaryote. So therefore, it cannot be viruses, it cannot be eukarya. The only option can be bacteria and archaea. And we've also learned that bacteria is a common um, uh, prokaryote, like I've mentioned earlier on. Now let's move on to the second question. So let's read the question together. It's saying that you are presented with a case where you have to study the organelles of different types of animal cells, and you're expected to provide the measurements of each of the organelles, and you have either a light microscope or an electron microscope. Which of these would be suitable for the project and why? Pause this video and have a go at the question. This is a tricky question, um, so the correct answer option for this is D. So let's look at the different answer options over here. Um, if you remember from the previous slide earlier on, light has a longer wavelength than electrons. So electrons don't have a longer wavelength, light microscopes don't have a shorter wavelength, so B and C is automatically out of the window. Your answer options would either be A or D, and you're just gonna have to think, what does a light microscope do? What does an electron microscope do? If you remember um, TEM microscopes, these provide 10, time, 10 million times more magnification, so therefore um, they're much more um, clearer in terms of cell structures that you can see. So they can clearly um, you know, show you and distinguish the different organelles that are present. So therefore, the correct answer option is D. The next question is relating to um, organelles. So this question is asking, which of the following is not true in regarding to vacuoles? Um, pause this video and have a go at the answer. The correct answer option is A in this case. So let's look at each one of these. Um, this is asking um, which one is not true, so we're eliminating the false one, right? So this is saying that vacuoles are exclusive only to plants. Um, and that is exactly not true because when we look at eukaryotes over here, in this table over here, you can see that vacuole applies to both eukaryotes as well as prokaryotes. Um, and eukaryotes include plants and animals, um, and plants and animals have a similar stru cell structure. The only difference is that um, plants have a cell wall. If I go back to our question, let me just go back. Um, in terms of the next um, few ones, we can see that vacuoles play a part in maintaining turgidity of the plant cell. Turgidity is pretty much strength, so and like the structure. And I said that vacuoles are structural organelles, so that gives um, that plays a part. Vacuoles take up a large part of 
the cells, since they are like fluid based, they actually do take quite a big um, structure. And you can see here that it's actually 70 to 90% of the cell. Um, and whilst I did not touch upon this, vacuoles actually do also store um, pigment for plant cells that give flowers their color. So yeah, that's pretty much um, this MCQ question. Let's move on to the next question. So this question is asking, identify one technology that allows us to analyze cell structure and explain how it is used. This question is four marks. So have a go um, and um, take around four to five minutes to write down your answer. And um, pause this video. All right, hopefully you had a go at um, looking at this question. So if we go back to what the question is asking, it's saying identify one technology and it's asking you to explore how it analyzes cell structure and explain. So the first mark I would be giving you is if you identify a technology for me, something like a light microscope or an electron microscope. Um, probably the light microscope is um, the easiest bet because, I mean, you'll be using it at school and you'll know it really well. Um, the next two marks come in explaining how the technology works. So you're going to be looking at how light works. So light has a longer wavelength, light is shunned through, and um, it pretty much shines through the um, slide and you can see the different organelles, right? And you can also talk about how you can adjust the knobs to see the um, specific structures. So those are pretty much your two marks. Your final mark comes in identifying what cell structures you can see in um, a um, light microscope. So that's things such as um, looking at the nucleus, the cell wall, or the um, cell membrane. So if you do those three um, key things, you would be gaining full marks. Um, and you would also get some bonus points if you can also discuss the limitations of technology. Um, one thing that light microscopes doesn't allow us to do is see other structures, something like the mitochondria. So if that's a limitation, you can like write that down and you would be getting bonus marks. All right, moving on to the next question. This is asking, um, in prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, which of the following are unaffected by the concept of nuclear bound organelles and remains the same in both types of cells? Pause this video and have a go at the answer. Hopefully you had a go at the answer. The correct answer option is A. Um, and you can see here that, oh wait, actually, Um, hmm, this does not look like the correct answer option. Um, one sec. All right, let's go through this together. Um, all of these, except the cytoplasm, is nuclear bound um, because all these have specific structures, whereas cytoplasm is literally just fluid. I think I got this um, from another question, so... The correct answer option is C, it's not A. I think I did something wrong when um, putting the questions in. Sorry for that. The correct answer option is C, not um, A. The next question is asking you to compare the structure of a Golgi body with the um, endoplasmic reticulum. This question is three marks, so have a go at this question. Pause the video and look at the answer. I'm not look at the answer, I'll find the answer and write it down. Hopefully, hopefully you had time to um, have a go at this question. So this question is a compare question and typically compare questions are three marks. Um, and they're pretty much 
just asking you to look at the similarities as well as differences um and if you look at that and look at the different similarities and differences you would need to firstly define what the golgi apparatus is what the endoplasmic reticulum is and give a general idea of what they are and i would provide you marks if you compare um both these organelles by providing one point of similarity and one point of difference the similarity is that both of these have thickery vesicles sorry um they're involved in protein production um, whereas the way that they're involved is a bit different. So um, Golgi body packages proteins, but endoplasmic reticulum has ribosomes that help produce proteins themselves. Um, so that's the difference you would see um, over here. All right, let's move on to a bit of working scientifically. Working scientifically is, oh no, um, let me just go back. Working scientifically is a really important part of the syllabus. And the reason why it is, is because recently, um, throughout um, the HSC years, um, you're not really seeing a lot of memorize and then regurgitate theory questions. You're really seeing application-based questions. Um, and the main thing is that not a lot of people get band sixes in biology. It's not because that they don't understand the content or because biology is hard, but rather it's because um, um, it's hard in the sense that you have to really apply your knowledge. Um, if you look at my 2021 HSC paper, literally everything was application based. Um, and it was really, um, I guess, a bit difficult in that sense because you really just had to apply your um, knowledge. And there's also more emphasis on problem solving skills as well as um, just application based skills alongside your content. And that's where your depth studies come in. Your depth studies give you that idea of it earlier on, so that's also um, really important to look at. Um, and the main skills that you really just be exploring within um, year 11 and 12 is things such as, you know, your reliability as well as your validity. Um, so these are things such as stuff that goes into your experimental method. Um, so reliability pretty much tells you um, you know, your results are reliable if you have consistent results. Um, and that's when you repeat it over three times or at three times. Validity pretty much just relates to whether um, you've met your aim um, for your experiment. And then accuracy pretty much relates to whether you use like the correct equipment. So for example, if um, I want to measure 10 mils of water, but then I use like a 100 mil beaker instead of using a uh, 20 mil measuring cylinder, then my um, experiment has already become inaccurate. Um, and another part of a method is also just keeping your variables constant. Some other kinds of graphical representations that are also important is looking at tables as well as graphs. Um, in your tables, you need to ensure that you have a heading as well as a title and include units only in the heading. Ensure that you also have independent and dependent variables present. So you can see here that independent variables um, are always on the left-hand side. And then on the right-hand side, you have your dependent variables. You also tabulate each of your results. And after that, you include a average that um, you receive. Alongside that, you would also have to graph things. So you would have to um, label your axes, use arrows on axes, um, include things such as title as well as a key. Um, and I've already also talked about experimental design as well. Um, things such as independent and dependent variables. So I don't think I'm going to touch up on that again because we've already um, talked about it. Um, and this is pretty much what your graph should look like. 
please make sure you use pencil as well. Um, you don't want to be using pen because um, teachers just don't like it, so just don't use it. Um, sometimes you may be asked to do a line of best fit or a curve of best fit. It really just depends on the plot. Um, and that's also really important because you just need to familiarize yourself with the different kinds of things that teachers may ask you. So for example, um, this is a year 12 example, but I'll still just mention it. Um, bacterial growth is not a linear, um, I guess like, um, growth, it's exponential actually. So, because what happens is that one cell divides into two and you know, if two cells divide into two, that's four. So you get my point. So that's pretty much like two to the power of N, right? Um, so bacterial growth has an exponential growth. So if you see an exam question with bacterial growth and they're asking you to graph it, don't do a linear graph because that's not going to work. So it's just having, you know, the different concepts in mind and how they actually look like when you visualize it. That's also really um, important. So yeah, this is what your graph should look like. Um, I've already also talked about experimental design. So that's pretty much your independent, your dependent, as well as your controlled variable. So your independent variable is what you change. Dependent variable is what you see after you have an independent variable present. And then finally, you have your controlled variable. So that's what you'll be keeping the same. Um, and I've already explained this, that's fine. And yeah, this is pretty much um, what the working scientifically, um, I guess, dot points look like. I'm just going to get a sip of water because my voice kind of hurts. Um, but yeah, I think I've already explained most of these. I've looked a bit at questioning and predicting with you guys. So I guess the key, I guess, concepts that you can um, identify is hypotheses, looking at primary and secondary data, and then for planning investigations, that's looking at risks, so that's risk assessment, um, evaluating, you know, what experimental controls that you have to ensure that it's valid. So this relates to validity, um, and this relates to reliability. So it's ensuring that you have um, an experiment that is reliable and helps to produce data that is consistent. Um, and you also have um, evaluations that occur. So that's pretty much just like how you um, can modify an investigation um, and create a um, response as well. So all of these are pretty um, important. Um, you also have things such as conducting investigations. So that's really just looking at risk assessment again, having safe work practices. So for example, um, if you're doing like, um, I'm just thinking of a biology example because I just thought of a chemistry one. Um, if let's say you're analyzing something like microscopes, um, and you're looking at slides, You'd probably be going for something like a plant-based slide than a um, slide that has blood, like human blood, for example, because obviously, you know, that may contain bacteria and that may expose you or your peers to um, risks within the environment. So these are all the things that you have to consider when doing um, scientific investigation. And obviously, these only apply to a year 11 and year 12 context once you go into, um, you know, university. You actually start doing things that involve, um, I guess, a larger risk. So things such as, um, you know, dealing with certain specimen or um, being exposed to different chemicals that can only be in the fume hood instead of just being, you know, out and about within, you know, like a normal chemistry lab. So, yeah. Um, adding on to that, you would also have analyzing data and information, like I have mentioned previously, so that's pretty much, you know, looking at what limitations you have in your data, why those limitations may have occurred. And that may just simply because, you know, you don't have access to certain resources that, um, you know, sometimes university students may have or actual scientists may have. 
Um, you can also look at things such as um, communication as well. So that's looking at um, evidence-based arguments um, as well. So there is a bunch of, um, I guess, different um, factors and sections over here. Moving on to um, skills for the exam. So not only are working scientifically skills important, but um, also your skills for the exam are important as well. So you need to make sure that whenever in an exam situation, um, you need to know your verbs really well. Um, know your verbs really, really, really well, because they're really, really, really important. Um, and the importance just increases once you see there's more marks to a question. So if we start off with the more basic verbs, we have things such as identify. Oh no, what happened over here? So we have things such as identify. Um, that's pretty much just you know, recognizing it and just naming it, that's it. So for example, identify this organelle. If like you have pictures of a nucleus, then you write down nucleus. So it's pretty straightforward. Typically only one mark or two marks maximum. Um, outline is pretty much identifying something, but then also just sketching what the main features are. Just tell me, for example, um, if they ask you to um, outline um the function of a ribosome i'll be like ribosome is located in the endoplasmic reticulum the rough endoplasmic reticulum and helps to package sorry it helps to synthesize proteins so that's what you would write for an outline question probably around one to two sentences per mark would be ideal explain is a bit more trickier because um explain pretty much means relate cause and effect so for example um, I'm just trying to think if there's an explain question that I can give. Maybe if they ask you, explain how the rough endoplasmic reticulum works with the Golgi apparatus. You will say that the rough endoplasmic reticulum has ribosomes. Ribosomes help to create proteins. And then these proteins are pretty much given and transferred to the Golgi apparatus so that it packages these proteins so that it's in a suitable shape to be um, utilized by the cell. So that's how you kind of explain things. So you're pretty much linking things together. Compare is also a simple one. Compare pretty much is just asking you similarities um, and differences that um, you would be needing. If we're further um, going on, analyze is a bit similar to explain in the sense that you have to identify components and then show the relationship between them. Um, for this, you need to be very intricately detailed, um, draw conclusions, and if it's analyzing results, then you need to show multiple perspectives um, and ideally you would write around two to three sentences per mark. Um, but this is really just a bare minimum. If you want to write more, write more. There's no problem in writing more. As long as you're not wrong, they won't deduct you marks. So feel free to write as much as you want. Um, you also have um, other kinds of verbs such as evaluate. So evaluate is pretty much making a judgment based on the criteria that you have. Um, this um, verb particularly um, tends to show up in long response questions. So I'm talking questions with more than six to nine marks. Um, and it's pretty important in the sense that you need to have good structure within your um, questions as well. If we um, further move on, you can also see that there's other kinds of verbs. So you have justify as well as propose. Um, and this is pretty much a nice checklist that helps to um, 
show you the um I guess like the different um needs so you would ensure that you have introductory and closing statement um, as well as judgment statements um, included whether it's an evaluate question um, or an assess question um, also ensure that you have key definitions um, and examples embedded throughout your answer as well um, if you want to be like that band six student ensure that you have a lot of diagrams tables flow charts whenever you can and once you're in like the eight markers nine markers you definitely want to be subheading your response um because actually without having subheadings you lose marks especially in chemistry um so for those folks who are doing chemistry as well just be aware of um this as well so yeah now it is um break time um we will have a five minute break um and i will see you guys in five minutes Thank you. 
All right, let's get on. Um, it's probably been around five minutes. Um, okay, so um, this is just an example of the different kinds of questions that we have at Shootsmart. Um, and yeah, let's move on. All right, so. The next section of um, this lecture is pretty much going to cover cell functions. So this is pretty much how do cells coordinate, you know, activities within their internal environment as well as their um, external environment. So this is an example of um, something called diffusion. So you can see here that once you put food dye, what happens is that that drop of food dye actually slowly disperses into the water and this is something called diffusion um, and initially they become they're very concentrated in the water but eventually it continues to spread out and once it's spread out um, it establishes something called equilibrium um, you don't need to understand what it is it's just it's more of a chemistry concept but yeah that's pretty much what happens and diffusion is an important way as to how cells um, transport things. Osmosis, on the other hand, is um, another way of how cells transport not specific substances, but actually just water from one way um, from one area to another, where it's at a high concentration, going down to a low concentration, and this path this pathway of going from high to low is something called going down a concentration gradient so it's across a um, semi-permeable membrane and in terms of um, diffusion you have something called facilitated diffusion so this is pretty much where um, Certain molecules need assistance in going across the membrane and therefore, um, and that's typically because, you know, they may have a larger size or they're not lipid soluble. Because remember that um, to actually go down through this membrane over here, you have phosphates and then you have to go down this lipid barrier. So if you're not lipid soluble um, and you can't dissolve in the membrane, then how are you meant to pass through? Um, and sometimes what happens is that um, molecules may be charged, so they may have uh, a positive or a negative charge. You don't really need to understand what charge is. Um, uh, that's more of a chemistry thing as well. But if it's a charged molecule, it actually can't go down the bivalve. So if it can't dissolve, um, then it can't pass through. And that's where things such as your carrier proteins and channel proteins um come into play oh no um let me just go back um and pretty much what carrier and channel proteins are are just proteins that help these kinds of molecules pass through um protein channels pretty much just help um it pass through a narrow passageway and then carrier proteins pretty much just change um shape of the molecule Um, and in terms of the different kinds of um, other kinds of transport that we have, so we've looked at um, passive transport, so that's both diffusion and osmosis. Facilitated diffusion is also um, passive transport. We also have something called active transport. So active transport pretty much just explores um, transport but in a way that energy is needed so this pretty much requires particles to move against the concentration gradient so instead of going from an area of high to low concentration you go from an area of low concentration 
to a high concentration. And this may be needed if your molecule is charged or if it's too big. Um, you also have other kinds of transport things such as endocytosis as well as exocytosis. Endocytosis is when your particles are too large um, and exocytosis is when you have um, pretty much membrane bound vesicles that pretty much fuse with the um, cell and it gets released. So I'll just show you pictures of how everything looks like. So this is pretty much what exocytosis looks like and endocytosis is pretty much where the membrane changes shape remember the membrane is fluid so it can change shape and so that this particle can come into the cell um, and then be just um, engulfed so this happens in phagocytosis so pretty much the bacteria just enters the cell and then the cell kills it um so that's how um you know a lot of um mechanisms work in our body phagocytosis is really important because um it pretty much just helps with um, ensuring that, you know, your um, body can fight off infection. And this table pretty much just summarizes how, um, you know, how things such as passive and active transport works. <laughs> And again, this is just a summary. You can see here that in active transport, we use something called ATP, whereas in passive transport, we don't use ATP. Another important um, factor that comes into play when you're doing exchange of materials across membranes is something called surface area to volume ratio. Surface area to volume ratio is important because it affects the rate of diffusion, so how fast or how slow um, diffusion occurs. Um, and one thing to note is that volume actually grows at a faster rate than surface area. So the way to calculate surface area to volume ratio is pretty much dividing surface area by volume. And smaller cells tend to have a higher surface area to volume ratio. And because of that, they are actually um, more efficient. Um, and here is an example. So you have a cube with um, two centimeters of side length and then cube B is six centimeters of side length. Um, if you wanna calculate surface area, um, you pretty much add up each side, like the area of each side. So therefore, you do 2 squared times 6 over 2 cubed. And that is pretty much 24 over 8, so that's 3. However, if you look at the second cube, it's pretty much 6 squared times 6 over 6 cubed which is 216 over 216, which is one. And therefore you can see that a smaller cube has a higher SAV ratio. There's also further biochemical processes that occur within your body. I guess the two main ones are photosynthesis as well as um, respiration. Photosynthesis and respiration are um, important because these pretty much are like the energy, I, they help with producing energy for your um, cells. So photosynthesis happens in plant cells where carbon dioxide and water and light in the presence of chlorophyll gets converted into glucose and oxygen. And then for respiration you have glucose and oxygen um, being converted into carbon dioxide water as well as energy and you can see here that glucose and oxygen are actually um, reactants in respiration whereas in photosynthesis these are actually the products
Um, and just to further compare um, photosynthesis and respiration, you can see here that photosynthesis occurs in chloroplasts, whereas respiration occurs in mitochondria. So it's a, um, for, for mitochondria, it's um, eukaryotic aerobic respiration. Um, aerobic respiration pretty much means um, respiration in the presence of oxygen. Um, and photosynthesis occurs to convert light into chemical energy and respiration it occurs so that you can produce energy. Moving on further into um, cell requirements. So this includes things such as carbohydrates. Um, you don't really need to know this dot point too much in um, detail, but it's still good to have just um, an idea of it. So carbohydrates are pretty much things such as monosaturides as well as disaturides and polysaturides. Um, and these include things such as um, having a single unit of sugar or two or multiple. And these are pretty much just energy sources. Your brain mainly requires um, carbohydrates um, and it's a source of quick energy and it's important for um, respiration. Lipids pretty much consist of fatty acid chains as well as glycerol. Um, so it mainly needs one glycerol molecule as well as three fatty acid chain molecules. Um, these can either be stored as lipids or they can also be used um, and broken down into energy through respiration. You don't need to understand how it works, um, but um, it's just still good to understand that it can be converted kind of into like a carb. Um, so yeah, it's really, it's really interesting and cool. You also have proteins, which I have um, mentioned on. So proteins are pretty much made up of amino acids and they help to um, form a polypeptide chain with um, protein bonds. And these are pretty much needed in order to ensure growth and repair. You also have um, nucleic acids, which are also important. Um, and you pretty much use things such as one sugar, one phosphate, and one base. And we've already explored certain types of nucleic acids. So those include things such as DNA as well as RNA. Um, and in terms of Further looking at what kinds of um, diagrams that you have in um, biology, you need to draw diagrams. This pretty much just shows you how you are meant to draw diagrams um, in biology. And you can see here that you need um, things such as shading, um, not having shading, sorry, and using things such as pencil. Um, try using most of the space that you're being provided within your diagrams because um, that is typically useful as well. Um, let me just go back into slideshow. Um, and moving on into actually what um, certain proteins are. So enzymes are a specific kind of protein. Um, maybe not, that's actually not correctly phrased. I mean that proteins can be packaged so that they become enzymes. Um, and enzymes are pretty much catalysts. Um, if, you, if there are any chemistry folks out there, you know that catalysts are pretty much um, ways where you can lower the activation energy of a reaction and then thus increase the rate of all chemistry reactions in cells. So these include um, certain kinds of enzymes, so things such as amylase, um, lipase, protease, anything that ends with ACE typically indicates an enzyme. Um, and these just help speed up biological reactions really. But at the end of the day, 
once they are used, they remain chemically unchanged at the end of a reaction and they're specific. And there are two types of models that you can describe how it happens. You have the um, lock and key model as well as the induced fit model. So there are two types of models um, pretty much explore different ways as to how enzymes work. So you have the lock and key model. Lock and key pretty much just says that you have an enzyme, you have the substrate, they join together and you produce a product. And you can see that over here. In an induced fit model, um, you pretty much have the active site over here and that the enzyme um, kind of shapes itself and molds itself to fit onto the substrate. Substrate is like kind of a reactant um, sort of that just um, binds onto the enzyme so that it transforms itself into a product. Um, and in school, you may do tests the effectiveness of certain enzymes of temperatures um, and look at how um, different enzymes work for um, different food substances as well. So it's really interesting. You also have something called cofactors and coenzymes. So these are kind of, I guess you can call helping hands for um, enzymes. Coenzymes pretty much bind to the active site and help in gaining the substrate. Whereas um, cofactors don't bind to the enzyme itself, but it also does the same thing. It helps to gain substrates. And this is just an example of how that looks like. Enzymes also have certain um, ways in which they function. Um, they have uh, a particular optimum rate in which they function um, and certain temperatures. So sometimes if it's too low, it will just slow down the rate of reaction. Whereas if it's too high, it could denature the enzyme. Um, and if the pH is too high, then, then sometimes that can cause the enzyme to denature. Denature is pretty much where it loses its shape at that point, it can't function. All right, I think that pretty much just wraps up the content for today. So um, from now on, we're just going to be just pumping out um, a few more questions. We'll take a break for um, the next five minutes as well, just a short break. Um, so I will see you guys in five minutes. Yes. Thank you. 
All right, let's get back into the lecture. All right, so pretty much like I mentioned, we're just going to be pumping out a bunch of questions. The first question is asking you to consider the following graph. So um, you can pause the video um, and have a go at this question. So for the how to go at this question, the correct answer option in this case is C. So if we look at it, um, you can see here that this is pretty much just representing different activation energy levels and, um, and it's asking what the gray line represents. So the gray line is... Um, Pretty much representing um, the activation energy required um, when an enzyme is pretty much not present. Um, so yeah, I think they've flipped around the gray line a bit. Um, I think that I mean this line over here. Um, but yeah, the bottom line over here represents the activation energy required when an enzyme is present. The next question is um, looking at um, the following image and it's asking you what process does it show to so pause this video and have a go at the question. So 
hopefully you had a go at this question. This question is showing you exocytosis. Remember that exo means going out, so therefore you're removing something out of the um, cell through the cell membrane. And you can see that because the vesicle over here um, pushes itself and then eventually gets released. The next question is asking whether cellular respiration occurs in what? Um, so have a go at this question. This um, question should be pretty simple. Um, and the correct answer option is D over here. So it's asking where cellular respiration occurs. If you didn't know, Cellular respiration occurs literally in every organism. So it occurs in plants and animals, fungi, etc. You name it. So the correct answer option in this case is D. This next question is a graphing question and um, it is asking you to um, represent the accretion energy required for a reaction in the body. That's pretty much what it's showing. And it's asking you which trend is being shown in this graph. Pause the video and have a go at this question. The correct answer option for this question is D. You can see here that um, if we just analyze the graph, the left hand side is showing quantity of products formed, right hand side, uh, right -hand side is showing 10 minute periods, right? So product is decreasing over time. Then that means, um, oh no, what happened over here? Just because the rate of enzyme activity is decreasing, that doesn't mean the quantity is going to decrease. Um, but the correct answer option is that the concentration of the substrate is decreasing, right? Because, um, um, how do I put this? Um, it's because if the substrate is what helps you form the products, right? So yeah, um, product does decrease. Next question is asking you to analyze the importance of the role of shape and enzyme to carry out the function. Pause the video and have a go at the question. Hopefully you had a um, quick minute to do the question. Um, so the question is asking, analyze the importance. And what is it asking you to analyze? Shape of an enzyme and function. So this kind of requires you to understand a, a lot of things actually. So it asks you to understand what an enzyme is, what the function is of an enzyme, as well as what, um, like how um, enzymes are shaped and that's through, um, you know, the processes and the organelles that are within the cell itself. The first mark I would give you is, um, to me, if you provide the definition of an enzyme um, and then you explain the structure of the enzyme. So remember, enzymes are literally just proteins um, and they are shaped in a specific way by the Golgi apparatus. So you need to kind of explain that to me. The next um, mark that I would give is talking about function. So enzymes are pretty much shaped through the induced um, fit model and um, the final mark would come in talking about the effect on um, enzyme function if the shape is changed. So remember that if the shape, the shape actually plays a big role in, you know, whether substrates are going to attach onto the enzyme, right? Because remember, that's how the enzyme substrate model works. If I go back, where's the slide? There we go. So you can see here that there's a specific active site that's shaped. So without this, it's not going to attach. So therefore, um, your shape is also really important. So without, um, the um, enzyme it cannot bind. The next question is um, 
having multiple marks and this has shown you part of a cell and it's asked you to label the diagram, identify the cellular component and justify the importance of selective permeability. So pause this video and have a go at the question. Um, hopefully you had time to do the question. Um, I've only attached part um, C, not part B, sorry. I think um, the question is not correct. So this is part C. Oh no, there we go. Um, so, first off, this should probably give you a hint that this is the cell membrane. So it's asking you to label the diagram, so you would identify what this phospholipid stuff is. This is the phosphate head, and then the hydrophobic tail, and then you look at what the protein channel is. So this is a um, transport channel. Next part is asking you what the cellular component is, um, and that's pretty much a cell membrane or phospholipid bilayer. Either is fine. And then the next part is asking you to justify the importance of selective permeability. This is also really important because this is the question that's linking not only what cell membrane structure is, but also what role does it play? So it's just asking you, you know, what role does it play? What is selective permeability? Explain that to me. So ideally, um, if you explained and defined selective permeability, I would give you a mark. And then um, if you provided two reasons, I'd also give you a mark. Um, um, sorry, I'd give you two marks, not one mark. I'm just going to change that. So, um, as I was explaining, two marks would probably just be, you know, the balance of having certain solutes in certain concentrations and then removing certain products that are waste from um, the body or the cell, rather. Um, so, yeah, that's how you would kind of um, define it. This next question um, is showing you the diagram below and it's asking you to identify the part labeled X and it's asking you what is the role of X. So pause this video and have a go at this question. Hopefully you had a go. Um, this question was really just relating to coenzymes. Um, remember that coenzymes attach to the enzymes themselves and you can see that here because that's what it's doing. So therefore, part A is a coenzyme. And what is the role of a coenzyme in an enzyme substrate complex? Ideally, if you define it and then link it to the enzyme activity, I would give you um, the two marks for that. So you would define what a coenzyme is, um, that they attach um, onto coenzymes and help in getting more substrates and attracting them. And therefore, it helps to increase enzyme activity. So that's the bridge and structure of the response that I would be um, expecting. All right, let's move on to um, skills for study um, and for pretty much practicing. Um, I guess each to their own, but there is, um, I guess, you know, different um, ways you can do things. So the first, I guess, general, I guess, tip that I would give is making notes. Um, notes are really important. It depends on how you do it. You can either write it down, you can type it, or you can do flashcards. Um, I did a mix of three. Um, so I started off with writing down notes, but that just took so long. It just was wasting my time. So I just typed it up. Um, and then I also did flashcards. Um, I also used a bunch of practice tests, which is really important. Um, and um, I pretty much not only did practice tests when I was leading up to my exam, but I also did it before that. So when I was doing my weekly revision. I also did other kinds of study methods. So I would watch um, YouTube videos. I would, oh no, I'm just going to attack. Um, I would watch YouTube videos. I would sometimes even make posters. I really made this um, poster of how the immune system works. I did this for year 12, by the way. And because there's just so much that goes into an immune system response, 
it's just so hard to not understand it without doing a flowchart. So I did a flowchart with different pictures at school and I kept that for the rest of my, um, I guess, year 12 bio journey and that really helps. So you can definitely do that for um, year 11 as well if you think that's something that will help you. Um, you can also study with friends. So, you know, do cahoots together. I feel like cahoots are really good because, you know, it just gets you into that competitive zone um, and... It's just a nice way to have fun, but also, you know, do a bit of learning at the same time. You know, maybe even go to a public library together or get lunch and study. So it doesn't have to be um, boring in that sense. You can also um, look at a bunch of other stuff. So things such as practice papers, past papers, um, obviously Tube Smart, um, as well as looking at things such as the HR Notes forums. Um, and you can also look at other kinds of YouTube videos. So Crash Course is really useful. Khan Academy is useful. Um, there's also something called the Amoeba Sisters. They're really nice as well. They're really fun in the way they explain things. Um, and these are just a bunch of different resources that you can use. In terms of further study tips, um, I guess the main thing in both HSC and Year 11 is that you should be studying smarter, not harder. Don't tire yourself out because I feel like well-being is also really important um, in the entire scheme of things. So don't lose your um, well-being. Um, in terms of study techniques, like how you start studying, I feel like there's two ways you can do it. You can either do Pomodoro where it's like, you know, you get a task, you set a time for that task, you do the task, take a break and repeat. Um, but I feel like I'm more of the girl that like does things in a flow zone. So like you have to just get into the flow. And once you're in the flow zone, then um, you really start pumping out work. Um, so that is really useful. Um, you can also do things where you kind of change up your environment um so change up your study area every now and then change the location of your desk in your room if you can um you know go to a library or a park and study use your backyard um you know if there's any place to sit outside um then you know you can use that area and make it fun as well if that's what you like um you know use cute stationery or um have little post-its where you know you motivate yourself use rewards for that as well, or even just, you know, set your friends on FaceTime and then just, you know, you guys don't even have to talk, but you can just like call each other and just do work at the same time. So that's also one way you can, um, I guess, just have more fun when you're studying. Um, and also if you do focus the music on, I personally don't. Um, I just find that it just clouds my brain. But um, sometimes if you focus with uh, music on and, you know, that noise level is okay for you, that's also something um, uh, you can do as well. Um, and yeah, so just have fun with it um, and just kind of enjoy the ride as well because year 11 is also just like a testing period for you. Um, and um, really year 12 is the main thing. So don't like study but just don't um overexert yourself as well um i think that's all i really have for today um thank you so much for watching this lecture i hope you guys enjoyed it as much as i do i love biology um and it's a really interesting subject i'm sure you're gonna enjoy it especially if you continue it in year 12 as well um and you know just enjoy the ride it's not something you should be stressed about too much because